And Thank you. Uh, with this, uh, we're going to move to our next uh, um, session, which is uh, a, actually a tutorial on these uh, specifications that are coming out and this architecture that is constantly evolving uh, um, from uh, Raj Rajan uh, Sivaraj. Raj is a director for RIC Architecture and Aura Standards at Mavenu, and uh, he's going to give us a tutorial on how uh, the Aura architecture has been designed and how uh, basically what are the foundational principles uh, in Aura. All right, so with this, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'll let you share your screen, Raj. All right, and you're muted just in case. All right. Okay. <laughs> can you? I if hope we... you guys can just give me one quick second. Let me just yeah, uh, sure. uh, share my screen. Uh, uh, okay. I, I hope you are able to see my screen now, I believe. So we're seeing the PowerPoint presentation uh, in the editing mode, and now it's in the presentation mode. All right. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so thank you so much uh, to Michele and organizers of the Open 5G Forum for this talk. Given that we are embracing openness in 5G, I think this is uh, a very important forum to encourage dialogue and discussion in uh, uh, the space, especially targeting open RAN architecture, which is in some sense uh, the fundamental and foundational framework uh, that is basically going to help us realize uh, open 5G systems. Uh, so I'm going to talk, about, I'm going to give a tutorial, uh, a 30 minute tutorial on ORAN and what is the buzz all about. Uh, so the way how I've organized my tutorial is I'll be giving an introduction on ORAN. And then the second part is why ORAN? Wh why do you really need open RAN? The third part is getting into some details uh, into procedures that we basically follow across, um, uh, you know, the ORAN interfaces. And then finally, some of the ORAN use cases. And uh, as a company, uh, I'm trying to also talk, uh, you know, briefly about my company, Mavenir, as to what we are doing in this open RAN space, specifically the RIC space. Uh, <clears throat> so, an introduction to open RAN. So, we know that this is kind of like a traditional LTE mobile network, right? Uh, so, what is the basis of an LTE mobile network? So, you basically have a cellular radio access component, and then you have a packet core component, and then you have your internet backbone, which is then connected to the uh, to the application server. Now, traditional LTE network, uh, traditional cellular network for that matter, operates on the principles of protocol and standards, right? Uh, we don't really operate on the principles of data and intelligence. So everything is defined by protocol and everything is defined by standards. Uh, the RAN component and the packet core component interoperate with each other. And then the user is connected uh, to an IP server through the RAN and the core component. That's basically how we have a traditional LTE mobile network. So moving forward, right, um, when we move on to 5G, uh, you know, we basically find that this particular, uh, uh, you know, this particular deployment where you have um, an LTE e node B, which basically has one baseband unit and multiple radio units. This is basically how, uh, you know, we, we, we architected a traditional cellular network. There was one integrated baseband unit and there were several uh, radio units. Um, and this is kind of like a costly deployment because we required the baseband unit uh, to be deployed, um, uh, you know, closer to each physical cell site that we basically had. So um, the baseband unit is the one that comprises of all of the functions of your radio protocol stack. And the radio units were responsible for uh, transmission of uh, signals and data. Right. And uh, with this integrated baseband, um, that's, that's what we call as a monolithic baseband or a monolithic base station. It is a costly deployment because it basically required you to deploy thousands of uh, baseband units uh, closer to your cell sites. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you have to deploy it in, you know, in a nationwide deployment, then it's always a costly deployment because you have to deploy baseband's closer to cell sites and the radio units, uh, which are in the actual physical cell sites. So 5G basically introduced this notion of uh, a disaggregated RAN architecture. So what we basically had in 5G was the baseband unit that you saw in 4G, uh, it basically got disaggregated. It means the baseband unit got split up into um, um, you know, a centralized unit and one or more distributed units. And then these were all connected to radio units. 
the distributed units were connected to radio units. Now, the centralized unit itself was split into a centralized unit control plane and one or more centralized unit user planes. And the CUCP or the centralized unit control plane talks to the centralized unit user planes using the E1 interface. And then uh, the CUCP talks to the distributed units using the F1 interface. So there is a control plane interface to it, and there is also a data plane interface to it. Right, so that's what we call as F1C and F1U. Control plane mainly responsible for context establishment, control signaling, etc., and user plane mainly responsible for data transmission. Now, what is the advantage here? The reason why we have this split um, is because of the following. So, because of this split in the baseband, you would be able to map individual layers of the RAN protocol stack to each of these components that you're seeing here to each of these logical nodes, logical baseband unit nodes that you're seeing here. For example, the radio resource control, which is predominantly responsible for, this is the layer that is responsible for connectivity and mobility of users. That moves to the centralized unit control plane. And then uh, you know your STAP, which is responsible for mapping the IP flows into data radio bearers, that goes into the user plane. And then the distributed unit, which basically is responsible for segmentation, max scheduling, resource allocation, modulation, uh, rate selection. These go to the DU. And of course, the and transmission app happens over the radio units. Now, the reason why the split makes sense is because all of these functionalities require different um, computational and uh, storage requirements. For example, uh, the operations in the DU are what you call as real-time operations because they happen in the granularity of transmission time intervals or TTIs. And the granularity of TTA specific operations is in the order of units of milliseconds. And you know, with 5G onwards, you also have TTIs in the order of hundreds of microseconds. So which means this operation here uh, requires, uh, you know, uh, it's, it requires a very, very you know, high speed processing while the operations in the CU are what you call as near real-time operations, which basically means that the granularity ranges from 10 milliseconds to units of seconds, typically from 10 milliseconds to hundreds of milliseconds. So here, it's, it's not computationally that intensive because uh, it's not as uh, uh, you know, frequent as the DU. However, this is the one that is responsible for maintaining state information, uh, of, of the users trying to maintain contextual information about users. So there is a, 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 you know, more of a storage requirement. Here inside the DU, you don't have much of a storage requirement uh, because it, it tries to receive information, it tries to process it in real time, and then it basically tries to do resource allocation, modulation, rate selection, et cetera. These are real time operations. So because of the differences in computational and storage requirements, right? It, it, this logical split tries to make more sense. And with this logical split, what happened? There was an evolution to virtualized RAN. So what, what happens with the virtualized RAN? So the network functions were moved from proprietary hardware to commercial off-the-shelf uh, software platforms, uh, for uh, commercial off-the-shelf platform. For example, uh, these CU implementations were moved to a cloud, were basically moved to cloud platforms like AWS, Azure, et cetera. So with, by moving to cloud, it basically helps in a very scalable and cost-effective deployment because Instead of deploying baseband units, individual baseband units closer to the cell site, you can basically have multiple baseband units migrated to a cloud-based implementation within a single cloud uh, uh, platform. So this is very scalable, cost-effective, and there is also coordination among, uh, uh, you know, uh, among the resources of a cloud. Coordination of the resources of the cloud for better load balance, uh, for for better load management and adaptation. Uh, in terms of computational requirements. There's a better load management when you're trying to have these functions migrated to a cloud-based implementation, right? And uh, however, these interfaces are still proprietary. Uh, these interfaces are still proprietary. And what you have inside these uh, units, the, the layer implementation, the implementation of functionalities are still proprietary. So this is the concept of virtualized RAN. The only thing is it, the implementations are moved from um, a, a proprietary platform to a commercial off-the-shelf cloud-based platform. Uh, now, moving to Open RAN. So, what is this? What what basically is this Open RAN, right? <clears throat> With Open RAN, <clears throat> we basically want the interfaces to be open. Uh, E1, F1, uh, you know, and and the front hall between the DU and RU. 
we basically want these interfaces to be open. What is the advantage in opening up the interfaces? The advantage in opening up these interfaces will basically enable, uh, uh, you know, we, will basically enable baseband units from multiple vendors to talk to each other. So it basically fosters multi-vendor coexistence. You can have the CUCP from one vendor. You can have CUUP from another vendor. You can have DU from a third vendor. You can have RDUs from a fourth vendor, and all these can, uh, you know, can um, coexist with each other within a single disaggregated uh, G node B uh, called the base station when you're basically having open interfaces. So open interfaces basically enable uh, baseband uh, unit components and also the radio unit components and general RAN components uh, from multiple vendors to talk to each other. Okay, this is kind of like a kind of like a boon for uh, operators who are looking for deploying multiple operator, multiple vendors solutions and enabling them to coexist in the field. Nevertheless, the implementations inside the baseband units are still proprietary. So if an operator wants to optimize some of the implementations, if, if the operator wants to optimize some of the algorithms that are implemented inside uh, the baseband solutions, uh, it was a challenge up until the virtualized ran onwards. So in order to enable an operator deploy his solutions in vendor hardware, or in order to enable an operator or a third party application developer, to optimize the functionalities and procedures of the RAN, OpenRAN introduced uh, two new components, and these were called the RAID RAN Intelligent Controller Components. So if you can see here, uh, there are two new components that were introduced. One is called the non-real-time RIC, and the other is called the near-real-time RIC. Uh, the RIC basically stands for RAN Intelligent Controller. And the purpose of the RIC is to make sure that uh, you basically have solutions for RAN optimizations ported and deployed in the RIC, and you can make use of some new interfaces, what you see as E2 interface, what you see as O1 interface. These are new interfaces that are standardized in Open RAN. You don't have these interfaces in 3GPP. Similarly, the A1 interface, what you see here, these are all standardized in Open RAN. The reason why you have these new interfaces is because you can have your solutions deployed in the RIC components, the near real-time RIC and the non-real-time RIC. And these solutions can be deployed in the form of extensible applications. This is what you call as XAPs. So RIC is a platform. You can deploy solutions either from the operator or from third party uh, in the form of extensible applications called XAPs and uh, in the form of uh, applications called RAPs. The, the, the applications that are deployed in the non-real-time RIC are called RAPs. Now, these applications will basically have RAN optimization solutions that will in turn control the underlying RAN using these open interfaces of O1 and E2. And the RIC components will also be able to get crucial information from the RAN using these open interfaces. So that's basically uh, the purpose of having the RIC components in ORAN architecture. And the non-real-time RIC is usually in a centralized deployment, in a centralized cloud-based deployment. It is always deployed within the services management and orchestration framework, which is a cloud orchestration platform. The near-real-time RIC is typically deployed at the edge of the RAN. And the non-real-time RIC and the near-real-time RIC also interface with an open interface called A1. So this is uh, you know, the introduction to open RAN architecture. And there is also one other interface called O2, which is basically responsible for cloudification and orchestration of resources. What does it mean? All of these um, uh, baseband units and the RIC components would be implemented in a cloud-based platform. So in order to, you know, to control the orchestration of resources, we make use of the O2 interface uh, and it, it, it kind of orchestrates the resources in O-Cloud. Okay. Now, uh, why do you really need open it, uh, Rash, one thing was a blue arrow in the middle of the slide. Yeah, I don't know why this arrow is appearing. <laughs> uh, I, I, I have no idea. In fact, uh, I, I, it's kind of like applying everywhere. I don't know why this is applying. I, I didn't see it previously and I kind uh, of don't know how to fix that. Do you want uh, to try to stop sharing and restart again? Maybe it's something. Uh, like yeah, okay, let me let me do that. Thank you so much. Uh, let me no, stop it's, sharing it's not, again. It's, yeah, it's yeah just give me one quick second. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah okay. Uh, okay, and then let me start sharing again. Um, okay, let me see if the arrow has gone. Do you see? Okay, now the arrow has gone. Okay, something weird. Right. Could you see my screen now? Yeah, it's coming okay. up. It's, it's, it's I, I, yeah. 
I'm not seeing yet. Oh, you're not you're not seeing the screen yet. Yeah, it says that you started screen sharing, but it's not coming up again. One second. Uh, do you see my screen now? Not yet. Oh, I don't <laughs> know what is the problem. Um, I it says that my my screen is being shared. Uh, let me see. Uh, Maybe you have something over the, the window. Uh, I don't know. Yes, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know why this is going on. Uh, I'm once again, uh, maybe let me, let me rejoin. Uh, if you can just give me 30 seconds, let me just rejoin. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, in the, in the meanwhile, I see, uh, we have some questions. Thanks. Thanks for asking them. We will collect them and ask them uh, at the end of a session. Uh, so while we wait, just a reminder of what's, what's coming up next. Uh, so uh, we're, we're going to have the uh, finish the tutorial with uh, Rush. And then we'll have a, a talk with uh, Paul Sutton from SRS Round that will be introduced the SRS Round project and the Overlook. And then we're going to have a couple of tutorials on how you can actually use this softwareized open source 5G stacks uh, on. Uh, uh, on um, Colosseum, which is one of the uh, platforms that are available uh, for uh, for this kind of research. All right, so I think Raj, you're now a co-host, so you should be, you, you can try again. I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, can you hear right. me now? Yep. Okay, very good. Uh, let me, uh, you know, start sharing again. Uh, sorry, guys, for the no, for the interruption no in the middle. Uh, can you now see my screen? Yes. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. The best engineering solution is always shut down and restart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry, we lost right. a couple of minutes. Uh, so, so, so basically, what you have? Why do you really need Open RAN, right? So there are three key functions in a RAN protocol stack. One is control plane, responsible for connectivity and mobility user plane that is responsible for data transfer and management plane, which is responsible for configuration of RAN parameters and network elements. And you always have layers of the RAN protocol stack in order to uh, manage these uh, functionalities. But there are always complex interdependencies among the layers of the RAN protocol stack. And these really affect um, uh, the performance of the network. And these dynamics are further um, uh, you know, manifested by dynamicity in the network and channel conditions, which basically affect the performance of these procedures. Um, so the, the vendor proprietary solutions need not always be optimal. They need not be programmable. They need not be configurable. And not all vendor proprietary solutions would basically have, um, you know, uh, uh, would basically have captured the interdependencies in order to optimize these functionalities. So that is why we would require to unravel this RAN black box. We require to unravel this RAN black box so that we open up the RAN. We basically make use of sophisticated AI, ML, data learning, machine learning tools in order to optimize these RAN functionalities because sophisticated machine learning tools would capture complex interdependencies among the input features or among these RAN parameters or among uh, the parameters associated with uh, the layers of the RAN protocol stack, which will then be useful towards optimizing these procedures. So uh, that's why uh, opening up the RAN and using sophisticated uh, data-driven solutions will be extremely useful in order to optimize these procedures. And that's basically what Open RAN is all about. Um, for example, if you see the user plane entities of uh, the RAN protocol stack, uh, you have the PDU session, which is your IP session, the IP session will have, each IP session can have multiple flows, right? And then uh, you have a layer in your 5G run protocol stack called STAP. This is basically responsible for uh, converting the, or mapping the flows into bearers. There is always one SDAP entity per PDU session. You, when you have a PDU session, there is, so these are all layers, but 
these layers can have multiple entities with respect to individual users that are connected to the base station. So there'll be one entity for one PDU session, right? And uh, these STAP entities are responsible for mapping the QoS flows into data radio bearers. And these data radio bearers are managed by the PDCP uh, entities corresponding to the PDCP layer. And then from the PDCP layer, they go to the RLC layer. And RLC layer is responsible for buffer management, segmentation of the packets into PDUs. And then the MAC layer is responsible for scheduling, modulation rate selection. And then the physical layer is responsible for transmission over the cells. Right? And uh, and this, these are basically the functionalities associated with the RAN protocol stack. And then when you go in, when you go to the R, the control plane components, you basically have the RRC entity, which is responsible for connectivity and mobility. And then there is a mapping uh, from the RRC entity to the signaling radio bearers, like how you have data radio bearers for the user plane, you have signaling radio bearers for the control plane. And uh, the, that's responsible for uh, transmission of signals between the user and the RAN. And then the underlying RAN protocol stack uh, entities stay the same. Uh, so this is what you see in a control plane operation uh, for a 5G RAN protocol stack. Now, each of these uh, uh, layers basically have these functionalities that they have to perform. Uh, for example, RRC is responsible for connectivity mobility, as we said previously. And it is responsible for selecting the primary cell, secondary cells, map uh, STAP entity for mapping flows to bearers. PDCP is responsible for duplication, multi rad traffic split, bearer management. RLC is responsible for transmission and buffer management, retransmission, segmentation. MAC is responsible for scheduling. The file layer is responsible for transmissions. Now, the solution what you have uh, in vendor proprietary implementations, again, need not be optimal, right? And because these solutions are not really standardized in 3GPP. The, the algorithms that you would be using to implement these solutions are always open. They are not standardized in 3GPP. So that's where you know trying to open up the RAN in order to address these problems becomes a very interesting use case or the applicability of open RAN. So towards going to the uh, final few slides, so how is open RAN basically working you know, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, the entire flow within in an open RAN system? So you basically have this traditional RAN that is sending, uh, you know, more uh, coarse-grained uh, aggregated information over this interface called O1, uh, which goes to the SMO. Uh, there is a non-real-time rig that is required in the SMO. Non-real-time rig is responsible for training offline machine learning models because it's in a centralized cloud. It has the computation and storage for offline machine learning model training. And the recommendations from the non-real-time rig are sent to the SMO uh, using the interface called R1. And then the SMO uses those recommendations to configure the uh, parameters for the network elements in the CU and the DU uh, and in the RU using the O1CM interface, uh, using the O1 interface and the open mplane front hall interface. Then the uh, machine learning models that are uh, built in the non-real-time rig are also useful in generating policies Non-real-time rig is responsible for high-level declarative policies for RAN optimization. Mm -hmm. The near-real-time rig is responsible for fine-grained UV-level optimization solutions. Uh, then the on offline trade model is deployed online. And then uh, the near-real-time rig receives fine-grained UV-specific data from the CU and the DU. And the near-real-time rig can use the deployed model as an inference host and it can also do online learning or reinforcement learning in order to optimize the uh, functionalities of the RAN protocol stack. So this is basically uh, you know, how Open RAN works, how these components in Open RAN work in tandem. And then step number eight is a repetition of step number one. So to kind of go towards uh, some of these in conclusion uh, in the next couple of minutes, so what you basically have over this E2 interface that is between the near real-time RIC and the CU and the DU, is you have something called E2AP that is standardized in Open RAN. Uh, it standardizes the procedures and messages exchanged between the CUDU and the near real time RIC. The contents of these messages are what are standardized in E2 service models. There are three service models that are defined in Open RAN E2SM NI, uh, E2SM KPM, and E2SM RC. E2SM RC is the first service model that basically enables the near real time RIC to control the RAN. 
at a UV level. This was basically out in July uh, 2021 ORAN specification. Um, I'll skip this one. The A1 is responsible for high level declarative policies, KPI targets, objective functions. This basically sets the optimization objective uh, and sends that to the near real time rig for fine grained optimization. Uh, and some policy guidance is also sent from the non real time rig to the near real time rig. Additionally, enrichment information, for example, predicted throughput or predicted latency. So these are other enrichment information, like for example, non-RAN information, like information about uh, the, the weather conditions, for example. So these are all sent uh, you know, uh, as part of enrichment information from the non-real-time rig to the near-real-time rig. And these policies are set at UV level, group level, cell level, slice level, et cetera. Right? And some examples of what you see here, policies on UV throughput, uh, throughput should be greater than or equal to 10 Mbps. Latency should be less than or equal to five milliseconds, like the constraints and an optimization problem that are basically set by the, uh, the A1 interface. And finally, what we have is this O1 interface that is responsible for cell level tracing and UV level MDT tracing to collect information about performance measurements, more cell level performance measurements, not much of UV level performance measurements. You have some UV level counters that you can collect over the O1 interface between the CUDU and the SMO, which hosts the non-real time rig, but it's more cell level aggregated information. UV level fine-grained information is usually collected over E2. And then SMO also does configuration management. For example, configuring the cell level transmission power, beam forming, beam tilt. This is all done over the O1 interface and also fault alarms and uh, notifications. So to go towards conclusions, I mean, there is one use case called slicing. If you basically think of ORAN use cases, right? You have one base station, you have three servers, one is an EMBB, URLLC, and a massive IoT, and you have three users. Each of them, ha them has strict requirements. Uh, EMBB wants you to stream, guarantee 1080 pixel video. URLLC wants you to guarantee 10 millisecond round trip time, and massive IoT wants to guarantee coverage. So you can guarantee these things if you have optimization solutions using open RAM, uh, because these all require fine-grained configuration and management. So to go towards conclusion, these are all other use cases to go towards conclusion, right? I mean, I don't have time to go over some of our design philosophies. Um, these are all the, uh, the different working groups that you have in Open RAN. Some of you are active participants in the Open RAN Alliance. So these are open working groups. And my focus has been on working group two and working group three, mainly to do with the RIC. And we also focus on building products. So my, I'm responsible for both standardization and building products in Mavener, RIC products in Mavener. So to go into conclusion, right? So we saw an introduction to Open RAN. Why do we need Open RAN? What are some of the details and procedures? We looked at the E2 interface, E2 AP, E2 SM. E2 SM is the first feature. E2 SM RC is the first feature that enables the RIC to control the RAN on a per UV level. Uh, and O1 interface is more at a cell level configuration. And then you, we spoke about some use cases like slicing. We reviewed the ORAN Alliance working groups. So that's it from this tutorial. Uh, so what I invite you for is let's work on ORAN to unravel the RAN mystery because it's always important to have openness in 5G to come up with very innovative third-party solutions and help foster a competitive ecosystem. Thank you so much. I'm open to taking questions. All right. Thanks, Raj. Very interesting presentation. Again, a lot of moving pieces and details and interfaces, but it's good to understand. And indeed, we... Uh, we have quite a few, uh, quite a lot of questions. So uh, let, let me start. And I hope I won't miss any uh, on the chat. So the, the first question that uh, came in was, uh, uh, it's more on the architectural side. So do you see in the future RIC solution completely replacing the OCU or the ODU? Or do you still see them as separate uh, components? That's a great question. That's an interesting question. The very first thing what I would like to tell you is that do not think as do not think of the RIC and Open RAN as a competition or rival to 3GPP. Think of Open RAN and the RIC as complementary to 3GPP. Why? 3GPP focuses on procedures, signaling procedures, parameters, etc. The radio resource management is open. 
For example, how are you designing algorithms for RAN optimization? 3GPP will not standardize a scheduler, a scheduler algorithm. That is never standardized in 3GPP. Now, Open RAN focuses on split of the radio resource management. Open RAN is basically not a signaling component that is basically going to directly manage UV level signaling stuff. Open RAN is not going to have the protocol RAN3, RAN2 signaling that you would see in 3GPP. Open RAN rig components are for the radio resource management functional split for RAN optimization. So what will happen is moving forward, the CU and DU may have more straw man implementations of their algorithms. And the more intelligent implementations will be available in the RIC as XAPs and RAPs. And using the E2, O1, A1 interfaces, the RIC will use those advanced machine learning algorithms like reinforcement learning algorithms, Q learning, deep Q neural network algorithms to optimize the radio resource management of the underlying, uh, the radio resource management algorithms in the underlying RAN. So think of the RIC as, an, uh, as a complementary intelligence to the RAN. Rick will not be handling the native 3GPP signaling procedures. Yeah, particularly it won't stand in the in the, in the data plane, right? It's just Correct. Control. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it can, do, uh, for example, it can do multi-rat traffic split, which is a mm -hmm. um, uh, which is a data plane functionality, but it will not directly come in the way of data transmission and stuff. Yes. Yes. All right. And then we have another question that says that. Uh, Considering how the 5G core got cloudified, the oh, uh, what is the role that hyperscalers can have uh, in the Oron ecosystem? Uh, can and I think the slide that you're showing here is probably right, right. already an answer, right? Right, right, right. So basically, more than speaking of with specific hypervisor uh, technologies, right? What you would see with Oron-based deployments is industry will adopt more cloud-native solutions moving forward and open RAN based technologies, right? Not just the RIC, but open RAN also involves OCU implementation, ODU implementations, right? So these will all involve cloud native solutions, will basically involve virtualizations, will involve, uh, you know, uh, clusters, pod instances, dockers, uh, you know, and, and, and you know, uh, complete cloud native technologies moving forward. So that is a, a brief answer instead of focusing on hypervisor specifically, uh, for having deployments at scale, for having optimization solutions at scale, cloud native solutions is the way to go forward. Mavener is a full cloud native software provider for the RAN, not just the RAN, but also packet core and applications. For example, we only build cloud native open RAN compliance solutions. We don't build any 3G, I mean, legacy 3GPP based traditional monolithic solutions. So that's the way how open RAN will drive vendors, newer vendors to move forward. All right, thank you. Uh, so there's another question. Um, so uh, someone is asking, my first question is about running the CU, UP, and CP. Are these, plan, are these plan hosted on the same hardware or can they be separated? They can be separated. They can be separate hardware. They can be separate. Uh, if you're thinking of cloud native terms, they can be in separate Kubernetes clusters as well. CU can be in a separate uh, you know, cluster. DU can be in a separate cluster. That is possible, but essentially, we would like them to be in separate hardware. The reason is because, as I said, the operations in the layers of the CU have certain differences from the operations in the layers of the DU, not just in semantics, but also in computational and storage. For example, DU will require more real-time operations. For example, you probably need a pretty more higher speed processing capability hardware, where CU is going to maintain all of the state information, like user-specific state information, right? Mobility management state information, context state information. So there is a lot more storage required, not much of processing uh, a, a intensive uh, hardware. So you can definitely have two different hardwares, two different VMs, probably have one Kubernetes cluster with two different VMs that's possible, or even have multiple Kubernetes clusters. So all these are definite combinations, but these are all different hardware components, but logically it is part of one G node B. It's, it's logical entities of a G node B. That's the one which makes things interesting. Yeah. And I think there's a good follow-up to this question. That is, uh, can you comment more on the virtualized part of the DU? So which of the MACFI parts can be virtualized? Right, so basically, uh, so some of the virtualized aspects of the DU, right, will include 
trying to have a, a scheduler algorithm. Uh, scheduler is one most important part that can be um, uh, you, that basically can be virtualized. Uh, some of the TTA level decisions may still be challenging because if you have to take decisions at millisecond level, right, it always is challenging to virtualize those decisions completely because of the stringent latency requirements. But your resource management algorithms within the scheduler will basically have a lot of policies. For example, think of the notion of uh, uh, you know common physical resource uh, elements for common physical resource blocks that are divided into logical resource block groups. What is the notion of logical? I have one slide here. Let me just quickly show that uh, without taking too much of time. So you have this particular use case, right? So what you do here, okay, I think I kind of like removed that slide because it was detailed. But what you do is your PRB resources are divided into several resource block groups so that each of those resource block groups will serve independent slices or will serve individual QCIs or five QIs. Uh, for example, you want a separate five QI based resource blocks for 5QI9, for separate for 5QI6 or something like that, separate for 5QI1, right? So that will not require changing at millisecond level. That goes by more policies for the scheduler. How are you trying to logically divide the resources, the PRB resources in the scheduler? These aspects can be virtualized because they are not going to change at uh, one millisecond level. But trying to have millisecond level DU operations like, uh, like scheduling for every TTI, that is where you see the challenge. But most of the scheduler algorithms is dictated by policies, which can be easily virtualized. Thank you. Uh, but we have a question specifically on the uh, RIC architecture. So why doesn't Torrent define standardized open interfaces between the X apps and the near real-time RIC? That's a great question. And... That's, that's, a, that's yeah. a wonderful question. Uh, yeah, so, sorry, go ahead, Michele. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah no, no, the, the end of the question is, it does this with the R1 interface. What? Why isn't there an equivalent in the, in the near real time? Exactly. So the, let me give you a quick answer to that. So as as one of you rightly said, maybe this is not the uh, the, the 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 right diagram. This is probably the right diagram for that. Let me just go. I have so much of diagrams here. So uh, first of all, right uh, as Michele was saying, the interface between the R apps in the non real time rig and the non-real-time rig platform and the SMO platform components is what is called the R1 interface. I have it here. It was difficult to kind of put R apps and show everything. It becomes a clumsier diagram. But R apps talking to non-real-time rig platform and SMO platform is what is called as the R1 interface. As when you go to the X apps, uh, up until now, yes, we did not have a standardized mechanism uh, for enabling X apps to communicate with the near real-time rig platform. But we have an ongoing work item in working group three in ORAN that basically comes up with the APIs, that basically comes up with E2 related APIs, which the X apps use to communicate with the near real time rig platform microservices. Take a look. I think uh, you, you should probably be someone who's looked at the ORAN specifications. Take a look at the ORAN working group three RIC architecture. It talks about having, I mean, it's not gone into the details. That's what we'll be doing in the next six months. We will define the APIs but it has gone into details of what APIs should be used by XApps to communicate with the platform microservices like database, E2 termination, E2 manager, subscription manager, et cetera. All right. So we are defining open APIs for that, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting effort. Yeah. Uh, I also know that Teep, for example, is working on a common SDKs that developers can uh, develop XApps independently of the RIC platform. So that's something very... Very interesting. I think we have time for a couple more quick questions. Then probably, Raj, if you have a couple of minutes, you can take a look at the others. But uh, absolutely, absolutely, I have time, no problem. Yeah, to remain here. And uh, I think just to cherry pick, uh, one question is: what are, in what areas or on uh, what areas in Oran should academic research focus on? I, I, I got a jitter. Can you just repeat your question once again, Michele? Yeah. Uh, what areas in Oran should academic research focus on? Ah, that's a great question. Uh, that's a wonderful question. And I think uh, uh, Michele himself has published papers in uh, open RAN space. I mean, some of his recent publications have been in the Oran space. I definitely invite a lot of academic researchers to contribute to Oran space because this is your main opportunity. See, one, see, I also did my PhD uh, in cellular network. Back then, right, uh, you know, trying to have an open base station was a huge challenge. 
right? So that's why people who worked on cellular network research had limited access to uh, test bits, right? Had limited access to cellular network test bits. That's why it was very difficult to publish a SICOM or a Mobicom or a Mobisys paper on cellular network research because you didn't really have access to, you know, proper industry grade uh, cellular network test bits. It was very costly and cellular network test bits are not open. Now with open RAN, right? You can define, you can come up with accepts. Academia can come up with accepts, for example, and that's why I had this slide, right, where it goes into the machine learning uh, solutions. Uh, uh, good, good that you asked this question. So, uh, in E2, just take an E2, E2 for example, uh, you basically have, uh, you know, the E2 interface between the CUDU and the near real time rig. And one of the service models of the E2 interface is called E2 SMKPM. It is responsible for generating UE level and cell level performance measurements from uh, from the CU and DU from the RAN. Now that is that can be sent over the E2 interface to the RIC. You can basically have a lot of machine learning algorithms in the RIC. This is one example of a DQ neural network, right? But a lot of neural network based algorithms, reinforcement learning based algorithms, right? This is where you can develop algorithms that will you make use of open data, right? Open E2 interface data that is standardized in ORAN, right? And uh, you know you basically have some ongoing activity that talks about uh, you know generating some open data sets for, for this E2 SMKPM data, right? So you guys can work on machine learning model solutions, come up with RAN optimization solutions, right? which can be deployed in near real-time RIC accepts. There is an open source community, OSC community that publishes an OSC based near real-time RIC platform. There is a near real-time RIC platform available in open source uh, community or an open source community. You can download that RIC platform, deploy your XAP. You know, you can kind of like, you know, uh, uh, use that XAP to test with RAN vendors. Or you also have open source uh, simulators, right? Uh, like simulators like NS3 that Michele has contributed significantly to. These are RAN simulators, right? So they have, they model all of the layers of the RAN protocol stack. So you can definitely use that to see how you can evaluate your XAPs and algorithms. This, so even without having a vendor solution in place, you can write extremely good Infocom, Mobicom, Mobisys papers using open RAN framework because you have some of these reference architectures in OSC code base. All right, thank you very much, Raj. I think there's a few very interesting questions, but unfortunately, due to uh, matters of time, I think we'll have to jump to, to the next session. So if you just have some time and stick around in the chat, uh, that, that, that will be great. Absolutely. And I, re I really appreciate your tutorial and all the information uh, that you gave us today. It's, a, it's an exciting uh, transition and being able to understand better how this works is, is really key. Absolutely, absolutely. Pleasure is mine. Thank you so much for uh, the opportunity and thanks a lot for the very interesting questions. Uh, I look forward to sticking on at the call to address your questions. Thank you so much. All right.